Hello, we are In Conversation with the Sanford School, a podcast from the School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University. Designed to showcase timely and informative insights from leading faculty, researchers, and other experts, which impact the ever-changing world we live in. Here at the Sanford School, we recognize that the lands where we are hosting this conversation at Arizona State University, belong to the Maricopa and Pima peoples. And we are privileged to be here to welcome you to today's conversation. In today's podcast, we're excited to be in conversation with our special guest to discuss the study of body image. Our guest today is Aubrey Hoffer, a graduate student in family and human development here in ASU's School of Social and Family Dynamics. Aubrey, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So how's everything going today? You good? Everything's going just fine. So how are you? I'm doing great. Can't complain. The weather's finally cooling down a little bit. So I'm excited about that. Um, so before we get going today, talking about uh, body image, I just wanted to ask you some just some questions just to get some personality out of you, just to find out kind of where you are on the, on the spectrum of everything social. Okay. Uh, so the first easy question for you is going to be, um, what would, what's your favorite either movie, TV show, or book, if you had to pick one? So movie is so easy for me. I'm a big movie buff. My favorite movie of all time is a movie from the 1970s called Harold and Maude. Uh, It's a fantastic story about the relationship between a young man um, who's dealing with a lot of sort of mental health crises and has this really somber disposition on life and then befriends this older woman who uh, is really sort of juxtaposed to him. It's fantastic. And the whole soundtrack is done by Kevin. Cat Stevens, who I adore. <laughs> That's a bonus. Yeah. Cool. Well, I was thinking you were going to say something like Star Wars, but I like <laughs> I like the uh, in depth uh, movie choice there. Well done. Um, so, how about beverage? What's your favorite beverage? It could be a hot, cold, alcoholic, non alcoholic. Just what? What's your go to? Well, I'll give an alcoholic and non alcoholic option. My mm. favorite cocktail is a Moscow Mule. I order it at every bar I go to. And non alcoholic is mm, probably like iced tea, like an Arizona iced tea. Okay. Oh, fitting since we're in Arizona. So another good choice. <laughs> so, um, so here's another one. So, uh, what is your, if you're a vacationer, I hope you are. Uh, what, what's your favorite go-to vacation spot? You know, I love to travel. I haven't traveled as extensively across the U.S. as I would love to, but one of my favorite cities is Washington, D.C. It's the kind of place that you could just get lost in forever. I think uh, any vacation time you spend there is not enough to absorb all of the amazing art, uh, culture, museums, and food. D.C. Mm -hmm. is probably the best food city I think I've ever been to. When it really is amazing that there is so much in walking distance that you could just get lost. So fantastic. Well, good. Well, thank you for sharing those little personal uh, details about yourself. I hope that gives some listeners a little background into where you're coming from. Uh, But today's podcast, we want to talk about uh, body image. Um, And so I kind of had a two part kind of lead off question for you um, because I'm interested to see, you know, A, how did you get into the study of body image and what and and sort of why is that what you're studying and along with that sort of what was your journey along that process to get here to ASU uh, before we talk in a little bit more about what you're doing so tell me a little bit about your journey and what got you into studying body image sure i think that my journey is probably uh, the most straightforward way to talk about how I got into body image. I sort of got into grad school in a pretty non-traditional way. So I started ASU as an undergrad and I got my degree in political science. And in my last, in my third year at ASU, I had the opportunity to do a policy internship in Washington, DC, because I really thought going into college that I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, specifically that I wanted to practice family law. So when I got this opportunity to be a policy intern for the National Network to End Domestic Violence, I was really excited, got to go out to DC. And my first day of the internship, 
I realized that I did not want to be a lawyer. I did not want to go to law school. And everything I thought that I knew I wanted about my future was totally wrong. <laughs> so that trip was really kind of amazing for me because when I was in DC, I got to do a lot of self-reflection and think about, all right, you know, this path that I thought I was going to be on is really not the path I want to be on. So what do I like? And my minor was in family and human development. And as I was sort of thinking about sort of, you know, what I wanted to do, I realized that in college, all of my favorite classes had been my family and human development classes, and that those were the ones I was most excited to take and the ones that I felt the most engaged in. So that sort of got me into, you know, pursuing grad school. Um, with the FHD program. So I had a great meeting with um, Kim Updegraff and she sat down and talked to me about, you know, what the program was like, what grad school was going to be like, and told me that I needed to find an academic, you know, advisor to get into grad school with. So I started sort of exploring the faculty at you and Really, that's how I came across Don DeLay, who is my now graduate school advisor. Great. And we had a really great first meeting. Um, you know, it's funny, in my first meeting with Don, we didn't even really talk that much about sort of research. We really talked more about our philosophies on learning and teaching. And, you know, I really felt that she and I were going to have a great relationship. And I sort of thought, you know, I don't really know exactly what I want to do, but I know if I'm doing it with her, I'm probably going to be on the right track. Uh, Dawn is a methodologist, really. She does a lot of work as a fantastic statistician. Uh, her specialty is in uh, what's called social network analysis, which mm -hmm. I'm now sort of learning uh, by osmosis through her. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I started at ASU and really when Dawn kind of sat me down for my first meeting, she was like, all right, we have to figure out what interests you, what drives you. And I did a lot of reflecting on really what sort of topics were important to me. And body image is something that is always on my radar. Um, one thing that I think is so important to my personal history is that, you know, I dealt with an eating disorder for several years. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is still in a lot of ways in my mind all the time. And when I was going into grad school and thinking about, well, what do I want to research? I wanted to understand something that I've always wanted to understand about myself in a sense, right? Like, why is it that when I was younger, I developed this sort of maladjusted perception of what my body looks like? And why is it that that maladjustment then impacted all these other facets of my life? I really wanted to understand the processes behind that. Um, and so that's really sort of what led me to doing what I'm doing now. That's incredible. I know that, you know, you have a chance now to study this and to come full circle from living it. You know, when I think of body image, that's what I think of. I think of, you know, all these magazines that show these stick models and, you know, girls trying to keep up with, with, with that. And, you know, I have a, a teenage daughter, you know, and I, you know, wonder if that's something that's on her mind. She plays volleyball and there's all different shapes and sizes. And, you know, how, what, what is that? What is she going through as a teen? So I think it's fascinating that you're able to, to study that. But I, I think you and I may have touched on before that your research is, a, is maybe covers a different audience. Is that correct? Yeah. So one thing that's interesting is, you know, your reaction to body image was thinking about, oh, girls and media. And, you know, I, that's really what most people gravitate towards. And because of that, a lot of the body of work and body image, <laughs> ironic, right, has been about, you know, usually young college aged white women and the way that they view their bodies, the way that they're sort of internalizing messages from the media. But what's important to remember is that everybody is getting those messages. Everybody is, you know, getting this influence from media, from parents, from peers, from romantic partners, and from themselves about what they're supposed to look like. So a lot of the work that I'm doing right now, you know, I'm still looking at white girls, but I'm also looking at boys generally and ethnic minority groups because it's really important that we do that work to say, you know, 
these body image concerns, they're not an issue that's only affecting one gender or one ethnicity. They're sort of impacting everybody broadly, but because the research has for so long only focused on one population, we get sort of this, uh, you know, malformed perception that, you know, it's only white girls who are susceptible to body image concerns when really it's an issue that can and is impacting everyone. Mm -hmm. Even I, I'm feeling it, you know, I, uh, I have a friend I remember, um, and he, uh, through high school, he wore hats all the time, just hats, 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 to the point where I think his hair just stopped growing, <laughs> and, you know, and so he was the guy that was sort of the young guy who said, Oh, man, I can't believe you're bald, you know, and he, and, but he, he embraced it. And, and I think about my own journey to where I am now, you know, just turning 50. And even I'm now dealing with body image issues of my own, you know, uh, my hair certainly isn't growing anymore and it's going way faster than it's coming in. You know, I've got the dad bod going on and, and there's all these commercials about the latest fashions and these, you know, the guys that you're seeing on TV is, is what doesn't seem to be reality. So, you know, even I struggle with that. Are you, are you finding that um, even in the male population, is there a certain demographic that you're studying and, and, and have you seen anything so far, any trends? Yeah, so most of my work has been focused on uh, a sample of sixth grade boys and girls. So one interesting finding that's come out of that is that just you know, um, in terms of frequency, if you ask boys and girls, what is your body image like right now? Or, you know, how much do you like your body? It's really the trends are almost ideal. And I think that just speaks to how prevalent these body image concerns are in that, you know, it really does replicate across gender where you see that, you know, for the most part, boys and girls are both in that middle range where we want them to be, right? Where they're saying, I like my body pretty much, uh, but then boys and girls who don't like their bodies, it's really similar frequencies. You know, I think that a lot of the trends that have been seen in the literature where people have suggested that, you know, maybe boys have just better body image than girls outright has been because of this precedent of, you know, forming body image questions around the body image concerns of women. Men and women have, you know, different bodies. They're socialized around their bodies differently. So when you ask a man, you know, about his concerns over, you know, fat gain or how big his hips are, he's probably not going to respond in the same way as a woman because that's just not a concern that as many men have. And sure, men, there are men who do have those concerns. Don't get me wrong. But over the past like 10, 20 years, Years when we've asked men questions about their muscle satisfaction, for example, you see that these rates of men who are dissatisfied with their muscularity are much larger and you get a much better picture of body dissatisfaction in men because you're asking them questions that are sort of socially appropriate for them. Most men aren't socialized to be afraid of being fat the way that women are, but men are socialized to think that, you know, they should have big muscles and they should have this certain body type in order to be what society thinks a man should look like. Yeah. I mean, I can speak to myself. I think I mentioned earlier, I turned 50 this year and I just, I have a certainly a different perception of, of how I was in, during my college years, you know, <laughs> um, it's a different physique that I'm adjusting to now. And, you know, I have, I have kids and I'm sort of, you know, fortunately for me, my wife is adorable and loves the bald look. So I'm one of those guys that's in really good shape when it comes time where I got to let it all go, let it all go. But just in terms of myself, my own masculinity, it's scary to think that that's a direction where I will be soon. Well, in our society prides youth, doesn't it? I mean, aren't we all given this message that, you know, the prime of your life is when you're young and, uh, you know, whatever. And really, that's not true. We have 
you know, abilities at any age in our life. We can still be attractive at any age in our life. And, you know, there's not age really doesn't prevent us from doing very many things, but there is this social idea that, you know, if you reach a certain age for both men and women that, you know, you're less desirable or you're less of a man or less of a woman. And it's important that we sort of bite against that and say, no, it's, I'm still, you know, a fully formed man man, woman, or whatever your gender identity is. Um, and I'm confident in that regardless of my age. Well, I appreciate the boost and I will forge ahead. <laughs> and I'm, glad, I'm definitely glad we're having this conversation. Um, so since, since coming to ASU, right, you were ex, uh, exposed to Don Delay, who is wonderful. And I'm sure you've been, uh, you've had the opportunity to collaborate and network with uh, with others uh, here at ASU. Uh, is there a collaboration that you're excited about now and kind of what's happening uh, in, in that respect? Yeah, so I actually have the opportunity to be working on a project with my good friend, Matthew Nielsen. Matthew graduated from ASU last year. He's now a postdoc at the University of Michigan. Matthew's main focus is uh, sort of broadly on masculinity. Uh, I'm gonna leave it to him to sort of talk more about what specifically <laughs> his interest is. But that was really where he and I sort of connected. And, you know, I was reading a paper of his that I'm a co-author on, and there was a citation in there about sort of the different aspects of male body image. And the sort of citation just sort of throwaway mentioned, uh, you know, male hair loss. And I remember I highlighted that citation and I said, Matthew, me and you have to do the balding paper. Mm. And Matthew was like, that is, you've got me hooked. Because Matthew, for anyone who's listening who has never seen Matthew, has a gorgeous full head of hair. But, and I think he would be fine with me sharing this, he told me that when he was younger, he used to be terrified that he would lose his hair. And it was something he was so, you know, insecure about. And it's funny because when I talk to any man in my life about this topic, they all sort of echo that same thing where it's something that they either have been very concerned about or are very concerned mm -hmm. about. So Matthew and I are working on a project where we're going to be talking to 18 to 35 year old men, and we're just going to be asking them a variety of questions about sort of their current hair status, their feelings of anxiety about their hair loss, their feelings of anxiety about their body, and, you know, sort of different measures of satisfaction with hair and body, because like I was saying with muscle dissatisfaction, you know, when you don't ask anyone, when you don't ask anyone the appropriate questions, you're not really going to be getting reliable results. So if there is this domain of body image, hair loss, that objectively more men would be concerned about than women, it's really important that we're asking men these questions. So kind of the big part of the takeaway for that project is going to be, you know, can men feel satisfied with their hair currently, but still be anxious that they're going to lose their hair? Or is it the case that they hate their hair right now and they're worried about losing it in the future? Like, is it this double-edged sword or can it be that, you know, you can feel pretty good, but still be really concerned about losing it? And if that's the case, then that makes hair loss sort of operate differentially than how we typically perceive like body part satisfaction. Mm. Um, you know, because for the most part, when people are concerned about different aspects of their body, they're sort of just overall worried about it. It's not really that they feel good about it right now, but then they're really worried that they're going to, you know, lose muscle mass in their arms. It's generally that you're either pretty satisfied and you think you're going to stay satisfied or you're not. So so we're really interested in sort of exploring that question and going into some depth there. Well, I'm excited to learn more about that and certainly empathize with the younger group that you're going to be interviewing in their 30s. Uh, just because of where I am today, I know uh, I, I got a good chuckle out of my hairstylist not too long ago. I said, hey, when you get, you know, cut it side, short on the sides and a little on the top and leave me some dignity in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, oh, it's not that bad. And I'm like, yes, it is. So. But that's going to be very interesting. I'm glad to hear about that collaboration. 
Yeah, well, it's really interesting because uh, about a third of men will experience hair loss by the time they're 30. So we're hoping that we can really capture that by looking from 18 to 35. Yeah, it's actually, it's about a third of men will experience hair loss by the time they're 30. And then almost half of men will experience hair loss by the time they're 50. So, I mean, this is really a topic that does impact most men. So it's uh, interesting that, you know, there has been a little bit of work done in this area. It's not that Matthew and I are the first people to ever be asking these questions, but from a developmental perspective, you know, this question really hasn't been examined in much depth. So we're really excited to see sort of across age, you know, is it that, you know, as men get older and as they probably are starting to experience hair loss, that it becomes on the radar? Or is it that, you know, men as young as 18, 19, 20 are really worked up about it? Like you mentioned with your friend who was wearing the hat all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that particularly if uh, balding or hair loss runs in your family, men are very cognizant of yeah well i i'm surprised even by you saying that the number that the range is up to 30 in the 30s when they start uh potentially losing their or having thoughts about that uh, i would just assume that it's a lot later uh, in life so i wish it was even later uh, <laughs> but um this is that's really an interesting and i I love the fact that you're working with Matthew because he is wonderful. And um, I, I think if we have the opportunity, we, we should definitely try to maybe get him on and talk about that work as it, as it comes about, because I think it will be of great interest. So. Oh yeah, definitely have me and Matthew on a sort of a tag team. He is so fantastic. He just has this total ability to light up a me. And I, I think he would shine in a space like this. Yeah. Well, it'll be great. I'm just glad to hear that he's doing great since he's moved on from here. So um, I'd like to know what, what sort of, you know, research either do you see yourself doing or, you know, what will you get excited about as you look to the future? Right now you're here, you're, you're a graduate student, you're on a fast track, you're going to be moving in even bigger and better things, I'm sure. But what sort of, uh, if you had to, you had a crystal ball and you saw some opportunities out there, what would you really like to say? What kind of collaborations would you like to see come together? Well, one thing that I think is really prevalent in body image literature right now is looking at body image from a socialization lens. Uh, there are two prominent theories in body image, uh, the tripartite model of body change behavior and the quadripartite model of body change behaviors in men. And what those models are sort of about are that, you know, there's these socialization influences that impact body image. In the tripartite model, it's parents, peers, and media. And in the quadripartite model, it's parents, peers, media, and romantic partners. And there's been a lot of great work using, you know, those socialization forces, socialization agents, and how they impact an individual's body image. I personally would like to step away from those models a little bit and focus more on sort of the cognitive processing or internalization aspects of body image. There's a theory called social discrepancy that really appeals to me. And social discrepancy is basically this idea that there's several different versions of yourself. There's your actual self, there's your ideal self and there's your ought self. So your actual self in terms of the body image is how I perceive that I look in this moment. Mm -hmm. Your ideal self is sort of how you think you should look, maybe based on what society tells you you should look like you should look. And then your ought self is how do you think you should look in this moment? And basically what social discrepancy suggests is that if those selves are far away from each other, if they have discrepancy between them, that you're probably going to be a fairly unhappy person. Whereas if those selves are fairly close together, you're going to be a happier person. This is something that I'm really interested in tackling in my dissertation. I think that it's a really interesting theory that just hasn't been utilized in full in its full potential for body image research. So that's really uh, something I'm interested in pursuing. If anyone listening happens to uh, subscribe to this school of thought, uh, please let me know because I think it's really great, so. Yeah, there has to be a collaborator out there for you in this space. It sounds, it sounds very interesting. 
and it just makes me even more again i hate to keep talking about myself but i always have these images i'm watching shows and i'm laying in bed and i'm like oh man if i just you know hit the gym and watch my diet you know i'm, I'm going to be shredded in like a couple of months and then it's just well, how do you get, get out of bed in the morning to even go do what you need to do to get that and is it even too late so um and there is a name for that i'm blank what exactly it is but it's sort of this idea of like how fixed you are in your perception of like how easy it is to change your body. Because I think that, you know, a lot of us, particularly in the United States, are sort of this message that, you know, you can have the, your body as long as you work hard for it. And if you really subscribe to that ideology, you're probably going to be pretty dissatisfied with your body because how you look is inherently your fault right and that's <laughs> yeah. not to say that you know we don't have control over what we look like obviously we do but i think that many people i know for a long time i had a very unrealistic idea of what my body could look like in a sustainable healthy way um you know like i know that for me there were certain numbers on the scale that I always wanted to achieve. Um, and now as an adult, I realize that, you know, sure, if I, you know, really like did not take any pleasure in eating and only ate like chicken breast and broccoli for every meal <laughs> and worked out several hours a day, I probably could look like that. But unfortunately I have a job and I also enjoy eating. So I'm probably not going to look like that. And that's okay because I like what I look like in this moment. And, you know, that's fine with me. So it's just interesting that you bring that up because I think that just further speaks to how these ideas are so ingrained in us right and like you know we have this sense of like control and that's also sort of uh an issue that matthew and i are focusing on in our balding paper is whether men feel like they have any control over whether they're they're going to lose their hair or not and how that compares to whether they feel like they have any control over what their body looks like mm. It really is so much to think about. Um, and I'm glad that you're uh, on the show today as a guest talking about body image, because now I've got my own little personal counselor on the side. So uh, <laughs> when I really start losing my mind, uh, don't be surprised to receive an email from me. <laughs> um, uh, but thank you for taking time to talk about what you're studying, what you're passionate about, and, and you know, kind of uh, welcome to ASU. We're so glad that you're here. I'm glad for another reason, um, because uh, I know you're going to be coming on board uh, as a podcast host here at In Conversation with the Sanford School. So I'm excited to introduce people to you finally, but we're excited to hear kind of what you have, uh, what you have planned. So can you give us a little sneak peek into, you know, what you hope that will be? Yes, I will. I'm so excited. So I will be sort of what I think I'm the first graduate student host in these podcasts. Hopefully mm -hmm. we get another person eventually. Uh, but really my goal for this podcast is to be primarily interviewing other graduate students and some faculty about sort of their journey to getting to where they are in their research program and sort of how they discovered the topics that they're interested in. I think that behind every academic, there is a story and a narrative about how they got to where they are. And I'm really interested in uncovering those stories. I think particularly with graduate students, you know, our narratives about why we research what we research are so personal to us, because at the end of the day, we're committing really our lives to studying these topics. So you should study something that matters to you and something that you think is important. So I'm really looking forward to having some guests on the podcast and being able to just talk to them about what they study firstly, but also just as important why they study it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's exciting. And I can't, you know, say it enough. Well, welcome to ASU. We are so fortunate to have you uh, here uh, studying what you're studying and, and, and we're, you know, so thankful to have you as part of this podcast family. I can't wait to see uh, what, what you come up with and who, how your interviews go. It's, it sounds exciting. Great. So welcome once again, uh, Aubrey Hoffer, and uh, thank you for your time today and have a wonderful day. 
If you would like to connect with Aubrey, you may email her at alhoffer at asu.edu. That's A-L-H-O-F-F-E-R at asu.edu. Connect with us and get access to all of our podcasts by visiting thesanfordschool.asu.edu forward slash podcast, where you will also find links to all of our social media channels. This conversation has come to an end, but our work here continues.